or Costa issue. <laughs> Πόντος. Τρεις χιλιάδες χρόνια ιστορία. Χρόνια ζωής, δημιουργίας, ανάπτυξης, πόνου. Πώς αποτυπώνεις τρεις χιλιάδες χρόνια. Τι θα μπορούσε να συμβολήσει ένα τέτοιο μέγεθος. Τα τραγούδια, οι χωροί, είναι το μόνο που πήραν μαζί τους. Ό,τι μπορούσαν να φορέσουν. Ό,τι μπορούσαν να κρατήσουν την κληρονομιά τους. Πώς να χωρέσεις ένα κτίριο 30 αιώνες. Υπάρχει άρα για ένα παγκόσμιο σύμβολο του πόντου. Η Παναγία Σουμελά είναι η άσβεστη καρδιά του ποντιακού ελληνισμού. Η μορφή της έρχεται στη νέα γη των ποντίων στα Σούρμενα. Το αποτύπωμά τη μένει ζωντανό και αγκαλιάζεται από ό,τι νέο χτίσουμε εμείς, οι απόγονοι. Το Μέγαρο Παγκόσμιου Ποντιακού Ελληνισμού κρατάει τη μνήμη του πόντου όπως τα βουνά κρατάνε την καρδιά του. Η καρδιά του πόντου χτυπάει εκεί, στα βουνά τη μαύρη θάλασσα. Η καρδιά του πόντου χτυπάει παντού, μέσα στον χορό, στην αγάπη για την χαμένη πατρίδα, στι παραδόσει που δεν σβήνουν, στην αρχαία γλώσσα που μένει ζωντανή. Ένα κενό που δεν αναπληρώνεται. Ένα κενό που πρέπει να θυμόμαστε. Μέγαρο παγκόσμιου ποντιακού ελληνισμού. Τόπο μνήμη, τόπο δημιουργία, αφετηρία μέλλοντο. That was beautiful. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for EMCA's 100 years, the building of the future global center of Ponte and Hellen Hellenism in Surmena panel discussion. This event is in association with AHEPA's National Hellenic Cultural Commission. My name is Lou Katsos, EMCA's president and AHEPA's National Hellenic Cultural Commission chairman. 
I will be co-moderating this panel discussion with architect, lecturer, artist, John Fotiadis. Uh -huh. Our distinguished panel today includes Rhode Island uh, State Senator Lou Raptakis, Hellenic Mayor of the Municipality of Hellenico Ariropoli, Yanis Konstantinatos, architect Sotiris Tsoulos, a TZA Group Managing Partner, and educator, community leader in Hellenic genocide issues, Peter Stavranidis, PhD. The formal presentation of this extremely significant project for Hellenism, which we will discuss in more depth today, was made by most of our panelists last month in Athens for the Hellenic people, as well as the prime minister and president of the Hellenic Republic. The panel will discuss the as aspiring plan to build the global center of Pontian Hellenism in Sumena, and whose aspiration is to become the hub of world Pontic Hellenism. It will, will be built in an area when in 1922, Pontian and Thracian refugees from the Hellenic genocide began to rebuild their lives from practically nothing. The panel will also discuss the historic background of the Hellenic genocide that led 100 years later to the plan to build this remarkable monument to Pontian Hellenism. The, this uh, area 100 years ago was called Hassani and is where the communities of Komnenos and Elinikov were created and became the site of the old Athenian airport, now the site of the Hellenicon project. The, arche uh, the uh, architectural conceptual design was created by Doxiadis Associates, Yanis Pazianos, with panelist architect Sotiris Tsoulos on a non-profit basis. It is anticipated the construction costs for this forward-thinking masterpiece will be taken up by Spiros Latsis, who responded to a request by the municipality of Helenico Ariolopoulos. At this time, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, uh, John Fotiadis, who will introduce the, the mayor for his presentation. Oh, thank you, Lou. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's also my pleasure to introduce uh, Mayor Yanis Konstantatos. Uh, Yanis is a graduate of the Athens University of Economics and Business and the Department of Communication, as well as Mass Media of the National Kapodistrian University of Athens. In addition, he holds an MBA from the University of Durham, UK, uh, a longtime member of the swimming team of Anuglifada. In 1993, Yanis was the front runner of Greece in the 4x20 freestyle competition. Uh, in the period of 2002 to 2006, he was president of the Association of Kefalonians and of Argyrupolis and southern suburbs of Athens. And until his election as mayor, Yanis worked for 12 years as a senior executive in a large satellite telecom company, as well as a communications consultant to companies and politicians. And if that wasn't enough, Yanis is also the author of four historical novels uh, and a member of the Greek Society of Writers. Uh, in the period of uh, 07 to 08, as deputy mayor of education and culture, he established the very successful annual cultural institution of the three-day youth festival. In 2013, he was unanimously elected leader of United City, a large independent faction uh, born of the unification of three other factions. Uh, Yanis is also president of SPAY, which is a very interesting organization, which is the Union for the Protection and Development of Mount Himitos. Um, it's an organization with the aim of protecting the ecosystem of the mountain which uh, sits on Athens's northern rim and develop developing it into a green lung for the city. Um, in 2014, he was elected mayor of Aliniko Ariurupolis, a position he still holds today. And in 2019, he was appointed president of the Hellenic Investment Management Body. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mayor Yanis Konstantatos. Kalispera. Uh... I'm very, very happy, uh, really, for, for the invitation. Let me thank you from the bottom of my heart for this invitation, everybody, all of you. Um, of course, for your uh, presentation. Uh, let me thank you sincerely for this, for this opportunity to speak with you and exchange ideas 
uh, about our center. And of course, let me thank you for establishing, establishing this forum uh, among the Greeks who are all over the, uh, the world. And of course, uh, let me say for Lura Ptakis that I'm very glad to hear again uh, his voice uh, because we have a lot of commons. And first of all, uh, let me say that sorry if my English are not very, very good and don't speak English fluently, but I will try from the bottom of my heart to be as good as I, as I can. Um, this forum today uh, between all of us, uh, it's very important because it enab enables Greeks to join their forces from different parts of the world. Uh, this forum, which is important for Greeks who live in Greece, but also for all, all of uh, you who live abroad. Uh, this forum which fosters our love for our country, because I think the Greeks who live uh, um, far away from Greece have much more strong feelings for Greece than the Greeks who live permanent here. This is my personal opinion. And I'm very glad to say again that uh, the strong part of uh, Hellenism uh, is in the States, in Australia, in Germany, all over the world. Um, I would like to express my pride as the mayor of this area. This area, which uh, was built uh, 100 years ago in 1922 by the Greeks from Pondos. These days, actually, we have the first people from Pondos who, who came here in uh, our area. These special people faced the hardships bravely. The barren and story area of Elinico, which belonged and then to the Turkish uh, Bay, uh, Hassan. The name of our place there was Hassani from the Turkish Bay, uh, and became their new homeland. Uh, they had the love, the memories, and the traditions from Pondos, nothing else. That's the only things that they brought with them. Inspired by their rich and long history, they built uh, the towns of Surmen and Argyrupoli, the new Surmen and the new Argyrupoli, which were, were cities with uh, 30 centuries history to the past. Uh, 100 years later, 100 years later, we have an uh, honorable cooperation with um, Dr. Spirios Latsis, the main investor of the Hellenico project, who has embraced our dream to build uh, uh, this center, you saw later the video, uh, the, the Center for the Global Podiac Hellenism uh, of Surmena. Our dream to build a center for locals and unite all Podians associations of the Greek diaspora. That was the basic idea. And uh, our dream is supported by Senator Leonidas Raptakis and all the senators and all the politicians, uh, the Greek politicians, who are elected all over the world, because we want this uh, center to be the base, uh, the united base for all the Greeks all over the world. The, this project brings us all together under, under one roof, and I feel uh, proud of this dream. It's a vision, actually, not a dream. And I'm proud because all of you uh, have embraced our goals to fight for our national uh, identity, preserve our unique cultures and traditions, and uh, honor to our ancestors. I'm proud of being the mayor of this town, and uh, this center, um, is, it was a dream, as I said before, it was a vision, but uh, with uh, uh, the help of Mr. Of Dr. Latsis and all of you who could be a, our force, not only to build this center, but how, the, uh, how it can cooperate to the next uh, decades, it will be not a dream, it will be a fact. And in this point, I would like to thank you, and permit me to thank uh, the Doxiadis office, especially Sotiris Tsoulos, uh, the architect. He's a great Greek architect. Uh, I was surprised when he saw the central idea of the center. Um, Sotiris is um, amazing, amazing to, in his world. Jens Pazianos, of course, and all his colleagues, all the office, and not to say more the words, I want to say in Greek something. Uh, ο πολιτισμός μας είναι πολύ μεγάλος και εμείς πολύ μικροί. 
για να τον σηκώσουμε. Αλλά όταν ενωνόμαστε με τον Σωτήρη, τον Τζούλο και τον Γραφείο Δοξιάδη ως αρχιτέκτονες. Με τον Λούτο Ραπτάκη, επικεφαλής της Ομάδας των Αποδήμων Ελλήνων. Με όλους εσάς που σήμερα μου δίνουν ευκαιρία να σας μιλήσω. Όταν όλοι εμείς οι μικροί Έλληνες ενωνόμαστε, γινόμαστε πραγματικά μια μεγάλη δύναμη, η δύναμη της Ελλάδος, που αιώνε τώρα, χιλιετίε. Οδηγεί το λαό μα μπροστά παρά τι κακουχίε, τι φαγέ, τι γενοκτονίε των ποντίων, τα εγκλήματα που έχουν με υποστεί. Γι' αυτό είμαι αισιόδοξο με την φωνή μα που ενώνουμε, τη φωνή τη δική σα και τη δική μα, ότι αυτό το έργο θα είναι πραγματικά ένα έργο ζωή για όλο τον Ελληνισμό. Θέλω να σα ευχαριστήσω. Συγχωρέστε με για τα μέτρια ω κακά αγγλικά μου. Δεν μιλάω συχνά στα αγγλικά, οπότε προσπάθησα να τα πω όσο καλύτερα γινόταν. Σε κάθε περίπτωση όμως θα χαρώ πολύ να έρθω στην Αμερική, να σας δω, να μιλήσουμε και βεβαίως να σας προσκαλώ και εγώ με τη σειρά μου στην Ελλάδα, στο ελληνικό, στην καρδιά των επενδύσεων της χώρας αυτή τη στιγμή, που όμως το επίκεντρό της δεν έχει την επιχείρηση, ούτε τα κέρδη, ούτε τίποτα άλλο, παρά το παγκόσμιο μέγαρο ποντιακού ελληνισμού, που θα είναι το κέντρο για τους πόντιους, την ιστορία μας και φυσικά για εσά την ομογένειά μας. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα, πάρα πολύ. Thank you. Uh... John, uh, I'm going to introduce you in a second, but before before that, before that, I think I'm going to um, I'm going to thank the mayor because I think it's very important for him to understand that his English is perfect, and not only not only is his English perfect, but we are waiting for him in the United States because, as you know, there's uh, many Hellenes, as you said, the support for Alas, the support for Hellenes. Here in uh, the diaspora in the United States, where we are right now, even though even though the Acropolis is behind me, uh, <laughs> we'll welcome you obviously with open arms and uh, and help support you and the tremendous uh, thing you're trying to do uh, in Greece. You are to be congratulated yourself, not only the architects but you as the mayor of the locality are to be congratulated for this fantastic uh, world hub that you are trying to create. I'm going Thank to introduce uh, uh, John Fotiadis uh, in, in a few minutes, my, uh, my co-moderator today. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce um, a good friend uh, for, for a presentation, and that's State Senator, Rhode Island State Senator Leonidas, uh, who we call Lou Raptakis. In uh, 1996, uh, State Representative uh, 1996, Leonidas, uh, State Representative We're getting, we're getting feedback, I think, right? Or no? Okay. In 1996, State uh, Representative Leonidas Raptakis became the first Greek-American state senator to be elected in Rhode Island by defeating a six-term incumbent. And before that, he had served in the Rhode Island House of Representatives. Senator Raptakis has won re-election four times. Throughout his public service career, He has been a staunch supporter of Greece and Cyprus. In December 1998, Senator Raptakis and other regional elected officials formed the Hellenic American Coalition of New England to inform their congressional delegation on issues of concern to Cyprus and Hellas. A longtime member of the World Hellenic Interparliamentary Association He has worked on a range of policy issues impacting not only the Hellenic Republic, but many European countries. During this time uh, in, in the uh, Rhode Island legislature, he has won passage of resolutions regarding the Pontian genocide, we'll, which we'll hear a little bit more on from our other speaker, Peter Stavranidis and which recognized the Hellenic roots of Macedonia, a peaceful solution to the Cyprus problem and safeguarding the ecumenical patriarchate uh, by urging Turkey to respect the rights and religious freedoms of the patriarchate and to reopen the theological school at Hafu. The resolution also called on the European Union to deny Turkish membership in the EU until Turkey changed its policies. Senator Raptakis was a leader in the successful Liberty Project, an ambitious effort that secured congressional pack, uh, passage of a special act authorizing the donation of the Arthur M. Huddle, the last remaining Liberty ship in private hands 
to Greece for, as a floating museum in Piraeus. And uh, Senator Aptakis and, and I and Emka, we actually did an event, uh, Senator Aptakis, where you were there right. and we discussed it on the 10th anniversary of, in fact, that uh, floating museum in Piraeus. And as a matter of fact, Emka had an event live in Athens on the ship for that 10th anniversary, where we had not only um, major uh, shipping magnets, but also uh, uh, Ambassador Pyatt, as well, as well as military leaders okay. for that 10th anniversary. And again, we thank you for that. It was a spectacular event that uh, you helped found, actually, when, when you were able to get that congressional act to make that Liberty ship one of only two Liberty ships, quite frankly, that are left, that are both museums, one in the United States and one in, in Greece. And the name of the ship, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Lou, is, uh, is Elas. Elas Liberty. Elas Liberty. Liberty. And, and, and for those who, who may not understand the significance of Elas Liberty, during World War II, uh, the, uh, the some of the shipping companies that were here in the U.S. and some of the ships that came into the U.S. because the war broke out and they had nowhere else to dock, the United States government actually gave some Liberty ships to the uh, to the Greek uh, merchant marines that were here. And that first ship that they gave the Liberty ship was called the Alas. Just for, for those who do not who do not know that history. So. Uh, this was a, a great event that, that uh, you know, that, that he did. In addition to that, um, he has been a leading supporter of the Trans uh, Adriatic uh, Project while promoting efforts to increase the quota limits for job opportunities in the United States and promoting the sale of Greek products in the United States. Senator Aptakis has also participated as guest speaker in the Greek Abrajani Chamber of Commerce on business and political relationships between the U.S., Greece, and Azerbaijan, and also on the petroleum business conferences in Thessaloniki. Senator Aptakis continues a dialogue with the Rhode Island's congressional delegation on issues of concern, such as blocking the sale to the Turkish Republic of the F-35 aircraft and addressing constant Turkish threats in the Aegean. Both of his parents were from the island of Andros, he is a member of the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in Rhode Island, and he is a member of AHEPA, Chapter 106, District 7. In Rhode Island, political circles, Senator Aptakis is recognized as an independent voice, someone who has been outspoken in promoting honest and effective government. He is one of the most popular politicians of the, of the state. Uh, Senator Aptakis, with that introduction, Please make your presentation on this great thank project you. in Greece. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, great job. And uh, let me tell you, the, the list keeps going on and on, but it's not for me personally. It's what we do for Hellenism. Everything that you just spoke about, it's something for uh, remembering our past, like we're doing today on this program, remembering today what is happening, remembering, you know, getting ready for our future, for the future generations, not to forget what has occurred a uh, hundred years ago during this uh, awful genocide of 350,000 people being murdered by the uh, Turks, the uh, Ottoman leaders back then, and not even to recognize it. But I think the most important issue here is passing the baton to the future generation, making sure that our uh, children, our grandchildren, don't forget what happened. I think the history of Hellenism of Greece is very, very important on all those issues that you touched about. But myself as a, a leader, just becoming this past year, the president of the World Hellenic Interparliamentary Association, which is about 93 elected members all over the globe, like the mayor had said earlier. And mayor, you've done a great job promoting what you've been doing in uh, on everything, whether it's the, the casino project, whether it's this new memorial, uh, there was over 400 people that attended in Athens about four weeks ago. You had the president of Greece, the speaker of the house, many, many ministers, many, many elected officials. It was, uh, let me tell you, it was an event that uh, will not be forgotten. But uh, what we have to do here is also recognize the fact that we have a country called Turkey, 
that does not want to recognize the Pontian genocide, does not want to recognize the Armenian genocide. And it's going to have to take us elected, 43 of us elected here in the United States, six members of Congress, two lieutenant governors, California and Connecticut, one secretary of state for Vermont, 16 state senators and about 14 state representatives in 20 states. Now, the state of Connecticut, the state of Rhode Island, has passed the Pontian Genocide Resolution, Rhode Island, for 15 years in a row. When Gus Siflides asked me in Connecticut 15 years ago, can you pass that resolution? We have passed it continuously, and we're going to do the same this coming May. My colleagues in government from Connecticut, uh, Representative Clarides and Representative Eleni DeGraw, worked with the mayor in Norwalk, Connecticut, and, and with the Pontian community of uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, and with Gus Ciflides, the president of the Pontian uh, groups of Canada and uh, United States, to erect a monument honoring the Pontian genocide in a public park. It's never been done in the entire United States. But what we have to do is, my colleagues in the 20 states were elected, is to pass a Pontian genocide resolution in every state, we also have to have Congress, our six members of our congressional delegation, attach language when the Armenian genocide is going to be uh, repeated and again passed by Congress for the first time last year to have this recognition uh, be part of the Armenian genocide because that, that year from 1915 to 1922, Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, Pontus, they were all massacred by the Ottoman Empire, which Turkey still does not want to recognize. What we're asking for is a recognition. Ask, recognize what happened 100 years ago, especially the 350,000 lives that were lost. And, and this is individuals from all over uh, the, the Turkey, uh, all over uh, uh, Pontos, the regions in Panagia uh, Sumela, uh, uh, which, which really is heartbreaking to see what they did, women and children, and all the way up to 1922 with the catastrophe of uh, Zmirna. So we have to make sure that uh, genocide doesn't occur again, number one, any genocide. And I think if we don't remember and recognize any of these genocides, especially the Pontian Greek genocide, it could have happened in the future. And I think that's what's very important about uh, the the drive of what the mayor has done with the Lazzi's family in building this memorial for all of us to cherish. And when we do visit Greece in the future, uh, Greek Americans, Australian Greeks, Canadian Greeks from all over, they can go to that uh, memorial, just like we have the Holocaust uh, Museum in Washington, D.C., to see what happened 100 years ago. So then history doesn't... Uh, uh, occur again. And I think I said it from the beginning. I, I've been inspired by the determination of the Pontian people and, and by their accomplishments, the spirit that has driven them to preserve their story and to tell it to the world that these horrors don't happen again. And I think that's the crust of this whole uh, issue before us. And, and Lou, I want to thank you very much. You've done an outstanding job remembering a hundred years ago what happened today and sharing it with the audience that's going to be listening to us today. I know this is a recorded program, and I hope those that weren't able to attend today, they see what is being told today, what the inspiration of uh, the memorial that's being going to be built in uh, uh, the our, our great friend, the mayor. And Lou, you said something earlier, and I'll wrap it up real quickly. When the mayor does come to the United States, I think the best time is is May 19th, where the Pontian communities of the United States do memorialize in Bowling Green in front of the Wall Street Bull. At the same time, uh, also an opportunity, if you can arrange it, is for Mayor Costadatos to meet Mayor Eric Adams. That would be great on May 19th for that to happen. And I think that's with COVID, COVID gone. Mayor, I know you tried to come to uh, Greece, uh, to, uh, to the United States back in, I believe it was uh, May of last year, and then again in November, but again, because of the COVID restrictions. But I think that, Lou, if you can hopefully spearhead this initiative, have the mayor come to the United States uh, the week of May 19th, meet the president of the Pontian community here 
in uh, the United States and the whole community. I think that would be a great, great honor for both Mayor Eric Adams to meet the mayor and for you to spearhead this initiative. I think it's a great opportunity to recognize the anniversary May 19th, again, of 22, 100 years later, right here in New York City, in the United States. And thank you very much. Lou, Lou, Lou. Thank, you, thank you for that. And uh, it would be my honor and pleasure, obviously, to, um, to be involved in that in the May, th in May uh, 19th event at Bowling Green. I, I do attend it, obviously, with, uh, with Gus, Siflidis, uh, uh, and, uh, and others. Uh, during that particular point, and certainly, if we can arrange for the mayor of New York to be there, that would that would be great. All, also, uh, the the Greek Independence also, Day parade, uh, the, the Greek Independence Day parade, the Greek Independence Day parade, which is um, uh, is going to be taking place on June the fifth. For those who um, who may not know, uh, I I am spearheading, uh, working with John Ketsimatidis, who's the chairman uh, of the parade, and I'm assisting him in that regard. And uh, certainly we would, we would be honored to have the mayor uh, uh, be with us during that important day. This is Mr. obviously- Mr. Uh, yes? can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Aptakis, yes, if, we, if we can have an official invitation from the municipality there or from you, we will be honored, we, will, we are honored to be there on the 5th of June and we can have uh, Adelfo Pisi, I don't know the, 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 the English word between the two cities or the two municipalities, because uh, Elinico is built- uh, Sister state, uh, would, a sister state agreement. Sister state agreement, yes, we, great. Because... We have, Mayor, we have oh, been discussing, yeah. just so everybody knows, we, we, will, we will and have been discussing uh, creating that sister city uh, scenario between New York and, um, and Athens. Uh, we did meet the uh, uh, last week, the Greek leaders, community leaders uh, did meet with uh, with Mayor Adams. We did discuss uh, Turkey. We did discuss some of the some of the comments that the mayor had made uh, in support of Turkey, and uh, we had a very uh, serious discussion with regards to that. Uh, this particular year uh, on the uh, parade is, uh, even though it's a year later, we, we are going to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the uh, of Greek independence. Uh, we will be we will be celebrating also. It's an important year. We will be celebrating the hundred years of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese uh, in the United States, and also the hundred year anniversary of AHEPA, which is again um, which was founded in 1922. We will be also as uh, one of the events um, uh, uh, support the anniversary of the burning of Smyrna, which we all know took place in uh, 1922. In, uh, in September. And we are, again, because of the uh, COVID situation, uh, we'll be honoring and supporting uh, the 2,500th anniversary of the Battle of Thermopylae, the Battle of Salamis, and the Battle of uh, Platea. So all these things are very important. Uh, Lou, I, I have to acknowledge and, and just comment a little bit on what you stated earlier. Uh, the genocide, uh, you know, uh, related to over three and a half million people, which many people don't really understand. It was a 30 year genocide, which started in around 1894 and which ended in around 1924. It related to the, the massacre and the genocide of 1.5 million Armenians, 950,000 uh, Hellenic people and 750,000 Assyrians. So, this year in particular is extremely important because next year is the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic, okay, in 2023. And as we all know, there are things that are happening and, and people will be doing certain things uh, geopolitically because, because of elections and things of that nature and things that are happening in their country. So no year is more severe than this year and in particular next year when in fact that 100th, 100th anniversary takes, takes place. So we have to be very careful and basically communicate to uh, various nations, including obviously the United States of America and our politicians and other people in the diaspora to their politicians, exactly what is taking place in the Eastern Mediterranean, which has been, which has been destructive to, to a lot of societies and people within, within that particular area. It's time, it's time that, we, that we become uh, people who are not deniers, in other words, not deny the genocide 
and Holocaust that took place uh, during that 30 year genocide and which, uh, which Hitler used right. as his example when people don't do anything for in fact the Holocaust and the killing of 6 million Jews later on during, during World War II. With that, I'd like to, uh, to uh, acknowledge my, uh, my uh, co-moderator today, uh, John Fotiadis, uh, who will be introducing uh, the architect of the project, Sotirios Tsoulos. Uh, John is a special friend, like all of you are special friends, and uh, you have appeared on our past panel discussions. Uh, John, who we call Yanyi Fotiadis, is a modern day Renaissance man whose creative endeavors span architecture, music, and the visual arts. His broader interests referencing to his creative output include history, philosophy, and metaphysics. John has been a licensed architect in the United States for 25 years and has worked in that profession of architecture for over 30 years. Over the course of his career, he has provided architectural design services to the top tier real estate development companies, both nationally and internationally. In addition to his projects in New York, John has also designed projects in Doha, in Seoul, Korea, in Moscow, in Panama, in Kiev, in uh, But Butumi, Athens, Istanbul, and Ankara. John's design experience covers a, a broad range of projects and scales, including residential, commercial, and hospitality design. And I personally have worked with John, quite frankly, in, uh, in uh, many projects that we did together, in my case, as the construction manager, in his case, as the design architect. John is also known for his musical talents, which include uh, having composed and performed music for film, TV, and podcasts. And additionally, he's an accomplished visual artist. His recent series of drawings documenting a, a, a number of ancient sites in Greece called the Solace of Antiquity has been met with critical acclaim here in the United States and abroad. John has spoken publicly on numerous and diverse subjects such as the inherent idea of branding as a component of contemporary architecture and how it traces back to the broader idea of architecture being imbued with inherent meaning throughout history. John holds a, a bachelor degree of architecture, cum laude, from Temple University, and a master of science degree in architecture and urban design from Columbia University. He is presently uh, uh, teaching architectural design at the West, uh, Westphal College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University. John is also, for those who don't, don't know, one of the founding members actually of EMCA. And, uh, and we're always glad to have you, John. We've done a lot of things together and we'll continue obviously to do things together in the future. Uh, John for the others. Well, thanks so much, Lou. Wow, I don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know what to say either with all Thank that. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's quite, a, uh, quite an introduction. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be involved uh, in these types of uh, roundtable discussions with you. You know, they're very intellectually rigorous and uh, engaging, and I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate the fact that when I mentioned this particular um, project that Sotiri has designed as, a, as an excellent uh, component of your broader activities, recognizing the Pontian genocide, that you, um, you reacted very quickly and we were able to pull this together. So I think it's great. And it's a, it's a very interesting meeting of people with very diverse backgrounds, but who have uh, common goals which I think is, uh, is excellent. So on that note, let me introduce uh, my very good friend and esteemed colleague, uh, Sotiri Tsoulos, who I've known for some time and who I, I immensely respect. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit uh, on his background and then he can talk about uh, the project that he's designed in detail. Sotiri was born in Athens, Greece. Uh, he studied at the uh, University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, he also spent some time in Vienna afterwards uh, in the 1990s. And it was during his stay in Vienna that he began exploring and applying contemporary Central European modernism as a tenant to what he was doing. Uh, his first contact with the Middle East and North Africa, where he spent a fair amount of his career, was with Hopkins Architects in 2005, 
where he worked on many projects, including um, uh, the Dubai International Financial Center. Uh, Sotiris established his own firm in 2006, and he continued to produce complete solutions on residential and hospitality projects. But never verging far from Greece, he was deputy site manager of the Olympic Stadium for the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens. And he's also been a site manager and architectural consultant for the archaeological site at Ancient Olympia. And so, Tiri, I'm saying this to you in public. We will visit there together. You have to promise me that. I know. Um, I just came back from there today. And it's I know. I know. I'm place, still, I'm still crying over the photos that you sent <laughs> yeah. to me. Uh, in 2012, Sotiris moved to Istanbul, where he founded and led RMJM Istanbul to produce master plans, high-rise projects, mixed-use projects, and hospitality projects. And one of the most fascinating projects he participated in at the time was the actual master planning of Mecca. Uh, I think that, that we could dedicate a whole separate panel on that alone. Uh, in 2018, he moved to Dubai as design director of RMJM, leading the company in many shortlisted winning competitions and awards. At present, he is a partner at TTZ Group, a dynamic architecture firm co-founded with two other Greek architects, I might add. Uh, TTZ has offices in Dubai, Nicosia, and Athens. And over the course of his fascinating career, he has designed and worked in Greece, Turkey, Austria, Egypt, Bulgaria, Romania, Kazakhstan, Iran, Iraq, the United Arab, Arab Emirates, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to name a few. Uh, I actually had the, the pleasure and good fortune to meet Sotiri uh, when we were both in Kiev some years ago, participating in an international real estate conference there. So he is um, uh, also a Renaissance man. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that I see a Greek architect of his talent and ability uh, getting the recognition that it deserves with a project like this. So there you have it. So, Tiri? Wow. wow. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know what to say, man. I'm so, thank you so much for your kind words. I'm just a fighting architect like you are, I suppose, like everybody around us. I, um, yeah, and uh, I acted, of course, as a principal architect of Doxiadis Associates. I just wanted to add this little uh, part, and I'm still am. Um, so it's, it was a great pleasure for me. After a big circle all around the globe, um, it was. Uh, I always had my eye on doing something good for Greece. It's you know we all want this. Once we go abroad and we become part of the diaspora. We always want to come back and say, all right, I, I need to leave my mark. I, I know so many things. I've done so many things. I need to help here. I need to do something. So when we, I had the chance to meet the mayor, uh, we started talking about it and uh, said, yeah, you know, give me the chance and, you know, we'll, we'll go on. What do you need? He says, listen, the first thing I need is the, uh, the global center of, uh, of Pontiac Hellenism. He says, it's so important for us. This place, this uh, city I'm, I'm leading is, um, is has never had a, a non-Pontian mayor before. And I'm the first one and I need to, you know, like I understand who they are, I understand where they're coming from. And it's so vibrant, um, like as a parenthesis, something he didn't say is that uh, actually the first organized Pontia community in Greece, exiled Pontia community in Greece was there. So 1922 by 24, 25, they were ready, you know, they had their community set up. Of course, they were in, in, in a shanty town and they, they had to work all the way to Athens, that's uh, 10 kilometers away. And at night when they were coming back, which is a detail I learned after I finished the project, when they were coming back from work and it was nighttime, they used to light fires in the Linicon so they would find the way. So there was a fire burning. So for men that worked in Athens to find their way through, that was like, it was so black and like nothing was there. So these guys, with bare hands and with stones, they actually build it. And going a step further, they didn't all build that. They went abroad, they went to Australia, they went to America, they went to the UK, they went to... And this diaspora continued becoming important and continued building wherever they are. And it's not only the Pontiac Greeks, but it's also the Asia Minor Greeks. Everybody who went abroad continued actually carrying these traditions and moving forward. I'm sure Mr. Sabrianet is gonna, is gonna go, but I'm just pointing out the pieces of my inspiration, you know, how it came together. 
So he came and he said, listen, we need this center. And it has to have the, it has to have a connection with Pontos. It has to clearly say that this Pontos. I said, okay, let me go and think about it. And then I started, uh, we started the research, which I have the presentation to show you. I don't know if you want me to start now or we make a first circle and afterwards, whatever you, start whenever, you like. Start whenever you like, uh, start whenever you like. All right, maybe I can go through the presentation now, Lou, and then we can show the movie after. Please, yeah, please. Yeah, all right, okay. I hope I'm not boring everybody. I'm gonna no, be no, it's not quick. boring at all, it's fascinating. I'm gonna be as quickly as, as, as quick as possible. Take your time, we have plenty yeah. of time. So I, what I did is I pulled together a few slides um, of, this is of course the, the, uh, the iconic, let's say, image of, of, uh, of the center. So I pulled a, a few slides. As we were working, we always start with site analysis. We're trying to go very deep to understand what's going on and what we're looking at. So mind you, the team was international. It was not just me. Uh, or a bunch of Greeks that knew what we were talking about. So I had to, to, and I wanted the team to be international because I wanted the team not uh, to have a, a, a colored already a opinion about what we need to do. So I had to educate my team of five, six people, and uh, you know what, what happened and what's the architecture there and what are the mountains and how how people moved around and how many people were lost and. Uh, all this, all this story, you know, we had to, I, ha, I had them reading for a week, you know? And then they were coming back to me with questions. So why this and why that? And why are they not, you know, why can't we find more artifacts than, you know, like instruments or weapons or their clothing? And, you know, we came up with the idea that possibly because they couldn't carry anything else. You know, this, the only thing they could carry was the verbal and the musical traditions and the clothes they were wearing and maybe the weapons if they were like. And then, you know, we pulled together the photographs and of course, we were, all the international team was watching the videos. Some of them were also from Turkey. And, um, you know, we kept going and we said, okay, what symbolizes Pontus? What symbolizes Pontus except from the sea? Because, okay, the sea is the sea. And, you know, there is not only the sea that symbolizes Pontus because Pontus has actually two pieces. It has the sea and it has the mountains. So this is a, this is a binary situation, but very interesting. But how can we, what's, what's the actual symbol, undisputed symbol of Pontus? And then obviously lower right, we came to Panagia Sumela. And Panagia Sumela is just a shocking piece of architecture and is also a shocking uh, symbol. Uh, as a symbol, you know, we started looking at it and how it moves around and you know, how it's placed and what if it has smaller spaces and bigger spaces and what's happening inside. And once you enter near the rock, you see all this richness. And it was clear to us that Panagias Mela is what symbolizes this. And again, we started working and reading uh, interviews. And um, all the interviews were talking about the void, about the gap. How how can we fill the gap? How can we fill the gap of the lost of uh, the lost country? Now this is Hellenic or master plan, and you see how central the site is on, on the Hellenic or master plan. See how centrally important, yeah. See this. So the mayor comes to me and says, "Yeah, top right corner, this red piece, this is where we need to put it." And I say, "Listen, this is not enough." But I clearly see, Mr. Mayor, that also the other areas belong to you. He says, yeah, can you do something about that? I say, yeah, Let's, let me think about it. So what we did, we were a bit rude, but I think it paid off. We worked all the areas instead of only that small site. Why? Because the first meeting, he says, listen, these people dance a lot and we need to make a huge space for them to dance. And I said, okay, <laughs> we cannot make a space in the top right corner. We have to have a space. We have to have the entire space. It's okay, go on. So then as a master planner, John, you, I'm sure you understand this sketch. As a master planner, I said, okay, yeah, okay. The small areas, we need to have the buildings. And then the big area, we need to have the dancing space. Maybe it can be half sunk, maybe this. And we started working, putting the piece together. This is before Panagia Sumela came into the picture. 
So I'm working the brief and I'm working the spaces and I'm working the volumes. It has to be human scale. And uh, there's a circle where they're dancing and how we're going to do it. But there's missing the concept. And the concept comes in now. And one of my guys says, you know what? I have this idea. He says, um, no, I have this. I, I found out something. I said, what? He says, uh, maybe we can use Panagia Sumela. I said, okay, let's put the scale, the, the plan scale one to one. The exact plan on the site, see what happens. And then this plan comes and it's exactly the same, this almost exactly the, the size, it fits almost exactly on the site. I said, okay, this cannot be a coincidence anymore. We need to work on this. So we were working. First ideas was to recreate the form of Panagia Sumela, like a phantom, like a ghost that, that's always there. See this? This was the initial idea. And then some buildings behind, but we never thought of stepping on it. Yeah? Stepping on it was some, some sort of um, sacrilege somehow. You know, it was stepping like on a, on, on, on a sacred space. So I really didn't want to, I really never actually wanted to step on the footprint. But then we thought of something like this. That would be really impressive. I'm sure everybody would be happy, but it wasn't enough. You know, it wasn't enough. And then we realized we don't need that. The only thing we need is to mark the footprint of Panagia Sumela and not touch it. So this is enough and a simple concept enough to explain almost everything. It sort of includes, it's an inclusive concept. It, it explains everything that has happened since then. And it also explains the future. The idea of the void I'll go on this side uh, afterwards. I'll go on the side in front of us. The idea of the void couldn't be more expressed than the fact that we didn't touch it. We built around it. We actually um, conserved, you know, continued to keep the void alive because this void is the memory. Because whatever we build around the void is whatever these people have created for the past hundred years. Whatever we build around the void is the future. And these buildings are around, as Panagia Sumela, which is its ghost, um, is holding the, the heart. These buildings are around, are holding the memory. So as the mountain holds Panagia Sumela, the buildings are holding the, are holding the memory in their heart. Right across from that, of course, if you see it architecturally, the building itself becomes a backdrop for the performance, because we always have the performance, because there is never a tradition without some form of performance. So, okay, the performance is set between the Black Sea, which is the water, and the Black Sea Mountains. And here is sort of close to its final form, where the buildings are shaped, like the rock is broken and a diamond or the richness comes through. Of course, there's a pedestrian street between, you know, you can't, we can't completely ignore it. The performance happens in front of these buildings. The sea on the left, the mountains on the right. And slowly we started shaping it, working the facades, working the colors. I wasn't very satisfied with these colors at this point. I was thinking, you know, oh, it's not enough. Okay, it might be let's say we call the way architects call it sexy, forgive me, or it might be interesting or whatever, but uh, it doesn't say anything. So um, we're talking with my visual, uh, my visualizer and we're thinking, I said, listen, man, I really need to put the music on the facades. Let's think how we're going to put the music of Pirichius on the facades. And then we come up with the idea. Um, yeah, John, how is it? Roll piano. How do you call it in English? Yeah, it's a, it's a piano roll. When it's a piano roll. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we come, we come up with the idea of actually putting the notes as piano roll and expressing it on all the facades. And this is now the final facade eventually. And here you see the, the actual footprint of Panagia Sumela, which of course is expressed. It has to be abstractly expressed somehow because it's not Disneyland. It's not a theme park. We're not going to see it exactly. We need to see it approximately. It needs to be a memory. Maybe we can carry some 
ground from there here. Maybe we can call it piece, a few pieces. It needs to be sunk. Now I'm going into architectural details, but this is all sort of interesting how we came up. It needs to be sunk a bit, like maybe one meter, one and a half meter below ground, because this reflects exactly how we dig out the archaeological spaces. They're always one and a half, two meters below ground. So this, re this is a, a subconscious reminder of what's going on. It's a set of buildings. We don't know the brief yet. We don't know what they need. But we know that with a set of buildings like that, we'll cover them because one can be a museum, the other can be a library, the other can be administration. And across, of course, we have the, the performance space, but the performance space is not only performance space. Obviously, if you want to be a global center, you have to have a conference space also. And in Hellenicon, it would be the best thing to be able to have a, a conference center for everybody, including the developer. Because as John knows very well, and Lou, I'm sure you do. No successful project is a project that doesn't take care of the developer, the city, and the user. All three have to be taken care of. So these are the ideas. And um, as brief as I could explain it, uh, these are some images maybe I didn't show on the, on the last presentation. Here you see the notes. The buildings change color from black to white. Um, you can see they have several types of, of spaces for relaxation, for performance, for, you know, the, the underground conference room does not affect, don't forget Athens is very hardcore in terms of uh, regulations. We don't affect the Athens uh, skyline. We make sure that it gets a couple of thousand people. It has meeting rooms. It has, you know, it, prepare, it becomes a center, a global center. Exactly. It's not a memorial center anymore. It's a global center that secures the future, that continues to help growth. So that's the whole idea. I love this image because even to the tiniest details, it really expresses my dream of how I want this place to eventually look like. Yes, the architecture is a bit different. It's okay. It should be. I shouldn't be reminiscent of anything else because this is a unique space. You know, if we could get this, if we could get this ground from Potos to put it here, that would be a really nice mark. And of course, the thing I talked to you about before, how it becomes a backdrop to the performance and a hug to the future, yeah? Because these people were born possibly 90, 80, 70 years after. And this is my final image. And I love this image where they dance in front of it. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. There you go. Okay. I finished. Costa, why don't, why don't we play the, uh, the video a second again? Because I think we need, we, now that we've heard this fantastic detailing, but not really detailing, Let's let's look let's let's see the video again because it it'll inspire us, and thank you so much, uh, Sotiri, for that wonderful wonderful presentation. Thank uh, you, thank you, Lou. <laughs> Costa, uh, please. Pondos. Three thousand years of history. Years of life, development, adaptation, pain. Πώς αποτυπώνεις τρεις χιλιάδες χρόνια. Τι θα μπορούσε να συμβολήσει ένα τέτοιο μέγεθος. Τα τραγούδια, οι χωροί, είναι το μόνο που πήραν μαζί τους. Ό,τι μπορούσαν να φορέσουν, ό,τι μπορούσαν να κρατήσουν. Την κληρονομιά τους. Πώς να χωρέσεις ένα κτίριο 30 αιώνες. Υπάρχει άρα για ένα παγκόσμιο σύμβολο του πόντου. Η Παναγία Σουμελά είναι η άσβεστη καρδιά του ποντιακού ελληνισμού. Η μορφή της έρχεται στη νέα γη των ποντίων στα Σούμενα. Το αποτύπωμά της μένει ζωντανό και αγκαλιάζεται από ό,τι νέο χτίσουμε εμείς, οι απόγονοι. Το Μέγαρο Παγκόσμιο Ποντιακού Ελληνισμού κρατάει τη μνήμη του πόντου όπως τα βουνά 
κρατάνε την καρδιά του. Η καρδιά του πόντου χτυπάει εκεί, στα βουνά της μαύρης θάλασσας. Η καρδιά του πόντου χτυπάει παντού, μέσα στον χορό, στην αγάπη για την χαμένη πατρίδα, στις παραδόσεις που δεν σβήνουν, στην αρχαία γλώσσα που μένει ζωντανή. Ένα κενό που δεν αναπληρώνεται. Ένα κενό που πρέπει να θυμόμαστε. Μέγαρο παγκόσμιου ποντιακού ελληνισμού Τόπος μνήμης, τόπος δημιουργίας, αφετηρία μέλλοντος Again, I have to say that was a fantastic, fantastic video and a, and a fantastic presentation, Sotiri This, this panel discussion um, is, uh, is called 100 years The building of the future global center of Pontian Hellenism. And we all have obviously a, a genesis for what's taking place and how, how this uh, future global center was created. It goes back, it goes back. And uh, that's the genesis, uh, genesis of it. And, and we all have a collective memory that has to come out with regards to the origin of this particular fantastic, magnificent building that will be built. I have the pleasure now to, uh, to introduce a, a very good friend uh, who has been with us many times where we discuss many issues, not only in EMCA, but in other forums. And that's uh, Dr. Panos uh, Peter Stavranidis. Uh, he and I and many others have discussed many issues, including uh, genocide issues, many times over the last, over the last few years. So it's my honor really to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Stavranidis is a successful entrepreneur and has been active in, Hellenic American in the Hellenic American community and has held numerous leadership posts with organizations connected with Hellenic issues of the diaspora and the genocide of Pondos and Asia Minor. As a passionate political activist and lobbyist for Hellenic and Pontian issues, He was instrumental in the unanimously passing of the resolution of the state legislature of New Jersey in 2006, urging Turkey to respect the rights and religious freedoms of the ecumenical patriarchy. He is the past president of the Pan-Pontian Federation of US and Canada. And in his tenure, the first state pro proclamations In 2002, regarding the Asia Minor Pontian genocide took place 
because of his special emphasis and activity with regards to that. He is currently the president of the Scientific and Cultural Organization, the Hellenic Link of New Jersey, and he sits on the Board of Trustees of the State Theater of New Jersey and the Harvest of Hope. Peter has a passion for education, uh, teaching occasionally, and as an adjunct professor, has taught in numerous institutions, including the Fashion Institute of Technology at SUNY, and currently conducting research on the history of the Greek Jews in conjunction with the Pantheon University of Greece. He is an archon of the Order of St. Andrew, the Apostle, and on the Education Committee of the Metropolis of New Jersey. He is also a, a decades uh, a member of, of, uh, of HEPA here in the US and a leader with regards to that. Welcome, uh, Peter, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Lou. You know, I feel so privileged uh, to participate in this panel with some very esteemed uh, members of the Hellenic community in Greece and of course here in the US of A. And uh, this is another magnificent initiative of EMCA under, of course, the auspices of AHEPA and the skillful leadership of a great Greek American whom I feel very proud to call my friend. And of course, that's Lou Katsos. Thank you so much, Lou. You're wonderful. And you know, I am actually moved and impressed with the previous speakers, and especially with the presentation of this so capable architect, Sotiri Tsoulos. And looking at the drawings and listening to the music and listening how into depth they went to get the perspective, the concept of Pontian culture and history. That, that's really great. And I, I, I commend you for all that, for, to you and your team, uh, Sotiri. And, and, you know, I just want to announce with pride <clears throat> that my credentials today, uh, okay, they have a little bit to do with what uh, uh, my friend Lou mentioned before about uh, the activities in the Hellenic and Pontian uh, issues, but also my connection to this area, Surmena. Why? Because Surmena is very, very near and dear to my heart. First of all, because my forefathers and most of my relatives are from Surmena of Pondos, and many of them, especially the ones that escaped from the former Soviet Union to avoid exile by the Stalinist regime in the late 30s, found a new home in Surmena of Attica. Of course, this is not the main topic of today's discussion, but, but it's good to mention these historical things that sometimes I see with sadness that many Greeks, even Greeks from Greece, to know enough about. In other words, we have to know that the first wave of Pondians from Sulmena and some from Argeupoli came right after the genocide, which was the first prearranged exchange of populations in the history of the world. So that's, that's the first wave and I think Allow me to share. I have prepared a small and short. Okay. So this is the, the map of Pondos, and I wish I had your maps, so dearly, because they're so much better and so much more clear. I'll what share them with you immediately and, after. Yes, yes. So here we see Trabzon. This is the province of Trabzon. And Surmena is right here, which is really, I was looking at the, at the maps <clears throat> in Turkey, and it takes less than 20 minutes today to go to Surmena, which is on the coastline. 
But of course, those years, especially uh, in the early 20th century, uh, there were some students from the nearby towns like Surmana, and they would find a way to study with the very well-known Frodisterion Distrapezumens. And I'm sure you've heard of it. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud to mention that my maternal grandmother had the opportunity to study that. Unfortunately, many Pondians decided to leave this area. And migrate to the nearest Christian uh, town that was outside of Turkey, and that was Vatumi, which was on the Black Sea. So here we have two waves. We have the first wave that leaves after 1922, and they go to Surmana. This is their first homes. And these uh, photos are not private. You can find them on the internet, it's very easy. So look at these people. They came from Pondos. This is the first wave, the exchange of the population. But let me go for a second to the second wave. So a lot of Pondians, especially Surmanitas and not only, they migrate before the genocide to Batumi, which is, and there they built some prosperous communities. They had Greek churches, they had Greek schools, and they were living a pretty good life until of course, communism came. With the advent of communism, a lot of things started changing. And in the late 30s, mid to late 30s, there was pogroms against the Greeks for many reasons, which I think I've discussed it with you, Lou, it would be worth it at one point in the future to cover this chapter, which I don't think it's amply, uh, amply covered even in Greece. And I know most of the historians, the, the friends of mine who have knowledge and have written books on this, uh, on this uh, chapter of history, which is unfortunately not known well enough. So the, what is happening then, thousands of Greeks, approximately, approximately 30,000 Greeks are sent to exile to Siberia. And almost none of them came back. One of them was my maternal grandfather, by the name of Angelos Thalassinidis. His son, my uncle, Stavros Thalassinidis, I hope the mayor is, is with us, still lives in Surmena. He's 96 years old, Stavros Thalassinidis. And I'll show you a photo of him lately. So we have two ways. One way is trying to escape the genocide Okay, the genocide. And the other wave is sent, thousands are sent to Siberia. I was trying to find, years ago, I did a presentation in Thessaloniki, in one of the World Pontian, World Pontian Councils. And I was trying to find the appropriate work for that. It was not exactly a genocide. It didn't have the characteristics of genocide. But after days of research, I, was, I found a political sci scientist who uses another word which is more apropos for this uh, situation. And that the word is also derived from Greek and it's democide, which in Greek means democtonia. So we have genoctonia, the first wave, leaves Asia Minor, and the second wave to avoid further persecution is because of the Moctonia. The Moctonia is when the, the oppressor 
targets a certain segment of the population which the oppressor thinks could be dangerous to the regime and gets, gets rid of it. So to make a long story short, the second wave also came not exactly to Surmana in the beginning, but they went to uh, segments of Athens like Calithea, and that's where I was born. I was born in Calithea, which at that time was mostly uh, people that had escaped oppression and mostly Pondians. So this is again Surmana, and this church is built in 1927, and it's the transfiguration of the Savior, Metamorphosis to Sotira, which still, of course, now has been built to a much larger church. This is the first elementary school. Of course, now the school is much, much bigger. And these are workers working on the main street of Surmena, which is the Yasunidu street. <clears throat> and actually, <clears throat> where my uncle lives, he has a four-story building, which is right on the Yasunidu street. And uh, I should mention that my uncle, <clears throat> Stavros Thalassinidis, he spent 30 years in New York working hard, and he was able to, 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 to build that uh, polykatkia, as they say in Greek, after 30 years of working hard here in the United States. Now, as, the, as we saw the video before, uh, the Pondians were able, wherever they went, to bring with them their culture, their history, their language, and their music. So we have the Pontians that escape from genocide. Now they speak mostly Pontian. That's their first language. And the more educated ones, they speak modern Greek, the ones that went to school, like the Prodisterio of Trapezudas, so or the one to the university. And of course, they speak Turkish to some extent. Some of them speak just Turkish. And that's another thing at one point we're going to have to speak about, whether the language is the only thing, the only characteristic that decides what is the identity of the individual. But that's another subject. Okay, so the first, mainly they speak the Pondian dialect. Now, the second wave that comes in, they do speak Pondia, maybe not as much as the first wave. And they speak more modern Greek because don't forget, they went to Batumi and they were able in a Christian uh, country to establish their own schools and their own churches. And many of them, like my father and mother, they were also Russian speakers. My father actually spoke fluently Russian because when, when they escaped from, from communist Soviet Union in 1939-40, my mother was 11 years old, my father was 17. So he had a better fluency of the Russian language. So I'm just giving you these uh, details just to understand the demographics, where these people, came from. Okay, so this is, this is something very important. Now, as I said, Pondians, when it comes to faith, and of course, uh, we mentioned Panayers from a lot before, when it comes to faith, when it comes to tradition, really, they're very dedicated. So there is one very special custom, honoring the deceased loved ones that takes place on the same Thomas feast day, Kiriaki to Thoma, as we say in Greek. And the cemetery, now cemetery is a Greek word, and it comes from the word kinitirio, 
Vilalikimame. But that day, the cemetery is not a cemetery. It's anything else but a cemetery. It becomes a ground of eating, celebrating, and of course, praying. And once the priest is done with the trisayo, do every grave becomes a table, a table that contains uh, Easter eggs, contains mezevets, contains uzo, and of course, last but not least, it, it has the, the kemenze, the lira, with the people dancing, and that's what got him through. It was the culture, it was the music, because we, the Pondians, have happy music, we have warm music, and we have very sad music. Tamir Oloya Puleme. In the beginning of my presentation, I spoke to you about my uncle. Here he is, 96 years old. I wish the uh, mayor was here because I would like the mayor one day to pay him a visit. I don't know how long he's going to be around. Uh, he's in front of, of my aunt, uh, Athena, uh, who passed away some years ago. So he's still active. He's a winter swimmer, but he's a living uh, resident of Surmana. And uh, I think uh, he should be recognized for that because he's, he's contributed a lot. And this is, again, that custom that has to do with the honoring the deceased. And this is the president of the Pontian Association, Enosi Surmenon, and Podiaki Enosi Surmenon, uh, an excellent gentleman. I had the opportunity to speak with him, Yorgo Sarafidis, and he's so dedicated. And here they are uh, after, uh, during the celebration of honor in the deceased uh, with the Metropolitan Adonius during the festivities of St. Thomas uh, Feast. And this is, this is the current uh, little space that they have for the Pondian society. But of course, uh, you know, this is gonna change. In a couple of years, two or three years, I think, uh, Sotiri, I don't know, I was told that it's gonna take about uh, three years, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And of course, from what I see, it's going to be a, a, a global, global. It's gonna be a global center of Pontian Hellenism. And, and I think uh, after what they suffered, and I don't know if you guys know that, but the Pontians, especially the Surmenites, they were from the coastline, the sea people. When they came, they selected that place and they were on the sea. I don't know how many of you know that, but I, I discussed it with uh, Yorgos Harapidis and he was telling me the details. But they had to move. They had to move because they started building the airport. So whatever small buildings or homes they had there, uh, they had to take them out in, in order to build the airport, which started in the 30s. And of course, then it continued with the American bases, which was, if I remember correctly, in the 70s and the 80s. So that moved them further away from the sea. And I think, in my view, this is a gift. This is a gift. This is a reward. I just, for, uh, for... since the mayor is not here, I just have to tell you this. He was very specific that we built it in this part of the development because specifically this part of the development was Surmana <laughs> to right. start with. You're so, absolutely right. Yes. So just but mentioning I... it, so you know, but, there is a you. backstory to that. Yeah, it's not coincidental that it's placed no, there. We had two, not. three other sites, but they had to be there, you know? Yes. You're absolutely right, uh, Sotiri, and thank you for bringing this up. 
uh, but uh, I just wanted to, to tell you, and, and you know, of course, uh, I'm going to praise my, my home again, Πενέψωτο σπίτι μου. Εμείς οι Σουρμενίτες είμαστε λιγάκι πιο κοσμοπολίτες, θα έλεγα. And I know I'm going to be scolded by, by my fellow Pontians who are listening to this, but it's okay. Lou is going to protect me. He always does. You know, so if, if, if they wanted to be close to the sea. And now the fact that uh, this great gentleman, a true Epatridis, and I'm talking about Dr. Spiros Latsis, he's uh, doing something which is, I would say, long overdue by the, by the politia. Uh, but here's an individual, a private citizen, who's doing that. And we're very grateful for this. We're very grateful. We're very grateful. And I'm, I'm sure the residents today, the residents of Argyrupoli and Nikon, are very grateful as well. And, and, and this is something that we we'll never forget. And I, I would take just a few minutes to contribute to the previous. I mean, I have many, many presentation PowerPoints about the history of uh, genocide at a Asia Minor, but I'm not gonna do that because I think we already have covered it and it's not the main point of today's uh, subject topic. So, but I just wanna say the role that we, as Pondians of the diaspora, played in, in, in bringing back those memories. I mean, I, I can't forget that it was here the, in the beginning of the 80s that we made the decision, we, the Pondians of New York, the Pondians of Connecticut, the Pondians of everywhere in US and Canada, in one of our um, annual conferences in New York to, to convince the then uh, Ipurgos minister uh, in Jess, who promised us that we will have our first World Council, Pontian Council in Thessaloniki, 1985. And then another Pontian minister, also Akritidis, Nikos Akritidis, he followed up. And that vision became a reality because if you don't keep something alive, no matter what it is, the Armenians were successful because they managed to keep that issue alive the Armenian genocide, and look what happened. It was recognized. So let's not ever forget that. And that's why I feel proud too, because we played instrumental role, the Pondians of the di diaspora, and especially the Pondians of the, the US that contributed to bring this up because we said, this is our generation. I know it took two or three generations that the Pondians had to reestablish themselves because they came with nothing. The first wave came with nothing and the second wave came with nothing. And they started from scratch. Especially the second wave, many, many came as orphans because half of the Greek Pondians were sent to exile. And I want you to promise me, Lou, that one of these days we're going to do one of these meetings dedicated, and we can have also scholars from Greece who have written books on, on the subject. So concluding, I would like to thank again Emka, uh, Lou Katsos, who has been uh, uh, so instrumental in having these conferences of, so many different Hellenic topics and always bringing the best of the best to participate in, in, in these conferences. And by looking at you, looking at my friend, Lura Takis, and of course, John Fotiades, we made a decision to keep in touch and to meet in Sotiris, who, I mean, I was moved. I was moved with that presentation. I was moved because this is something that I foresee it would be a center, a global center. Thank you so much, Efrestov.
Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that. And uh, I, I don't have to promise because, as you know, when we come up with certain things, we, we just do it. We do it. So, so, so you, were dis you were discussing, obviously, something that's not known by most, uh, most people, including Hellenic people. And that, that has to do with the Soviet Union and what they used to call, what they called the Greek Operation NKVD. It started, it started around uh, December 15th of 1937, and it lasted for 15 years, okay? It was a program, and up to 50,000, up to 50,000 Hellenic people died during that process. And it's something, obviously, that we have to discuss, uh, Peter Pano, because we cannot, uh, as you said before, where we remember the dead, or those, let's say, who are asleep, okay, asleep in the Lord, what we call asleep in the Lord, in our particular faith because our, of our beliefs, we cannot let their memories go, you know, and no one knows about them. So we have to discuss this particular issue. I think it's an important thing, and I'm, I'm so happy that you brought it up today. What I'd like to do is just um, say a few things, ask, ask, uh, ask uh, uh, Rhode Island Senator, uh, Raptakis uh, to, to give some uh, remarks on what he's heard. And then I'd like to turn it over to John who could have some discussions uh, with Sotiri on any questions he may, he may have architecturally. And then, and then what I wanna do is just wrap it up. So uh, if you can, um, uh, Lou uh, Raptakis, uh, give us your thoughts on uh, some of the things we discussed today and just this amazing project that you have been uh, central to in many different ways through the support of, of many of the representatives around the world to help create this particular project. Uh, Lou, a lot has been said. I don't want to recap anything, but moving forward, I think it's very important that we, we keep working even harder to make this dream a reality, to make the completion of this museum in, in Athens, in Argyrupoli, Lincoln. I've had the pleasure to have dinner with the mayor, the architect. And what I want to say lastly, I think that May 19th, this coming May 19th, is when the time that the mayor should come to the United States with the architect and present what we saw today to many of the Pontian communities in Connecticut, New York, wherever, but here's what's more, most important. You have the mayor come to New York, meet the mayor, sign a sister city agreement between New York and Argyrupoli Linikon, have them visit the mayor of Norwalk, Connecticut, the memorial, have them meet with the two, uh, the, the uh, Representative Clarides and uh, Representative DeGraw to honor the mayor in the Connecticut legislature where they continue to start passing the, the continue for two years now, the Pontiac Genocide Resolution, Rhode Island, 15 years, and then go to Washington and meet with the Congressional Hellenic delegation. Lou, you lead the charge to make sure that maybe we can adopt language with the Armenian Genocide Resolution to honor and recognize. The standalone bill might be a lot difficult. You saw what it took for the Armenian Genocide Resolution to pass. But we dovetail that and have the mayor meet with Jewish officials, visit the Holocaust, visit the uh, Armenian... Uh, Leadership uh, uh, Commission in uh, Washington, D.C. I think it's a great trip May 19th to do New York City, Norwalk, Connecticut, and D.C. to send a strong message and to meet a lot of the leaders, the non-Greek members of Congress also, to really take this above and beyond. But I think the mayor and the, uh, the architect should come to the United States with a presentation, have a dinner May 19th, the evening of May 19th, the day of raising the flag, in Bowling Green, I think it's a great, don't, don't let's lose uh, the focus, but I think we're just going to keep sending a stronger message. Lou, what do you think? Is this the year? I, I think I think this is the year. Obviously, we have to coordinate with a few people, including, including Gus that we Correct. discussed earlier. Obviously, we're, we're going to have to have the various organizations um, around what's taking place to make this an important, uh, important year. And I agree with you, Lou, and, and the fact that Again, there's a lot of things that are being uh, represented uh, relating to the, uh, the Greek Independence Day Parade in New York. As you know, we've had our issues here and I've tried to, uh, you know, to get everybody to, 
coordinate together. It's been kind of complicated sure. and, and very difficult. Uh, but I, I, think, I think you're right. And, I, and I'll coordinate with you, obviously, uh, in that particular issue, because I think, I think it's very important. And this is, this is the year, because, because next year is the, right. is the 100th anniversary of the, of the uh, Turkish Republic, which was built on genocide. It was built on genocide. It was built on an right. exchange of populations. And it was built economically on the taking over of, of different concerns that were owned by other people. Not only different concerns, companies and things of that nature, but also their homes, etc. The foundations, the foundations so, were based on, on the genocide. Well, 1.5 uh, million. Yeah, 1.5 million Greeks left um, Asia Minor, a good number of Pontians that came to Greece and, and settled what we just discussed today. I think it all ties in. And it all, Peter, it all, you did a great job. In. Uh, it all ties in. And, I, and, and Lou, I, I have to, I have to, because I always say what I believe. I have to say that part of the problem has been with the Hellenic Republic itself, okay, in that they themselves did not recognize the genocide until right. decades later. That they themselves, in fact, <laughs> We're trying to uh, keep uh, good uh, relationships with others and not really discussing these issues. And, and it's from the diaspora, in many cases, that a lot of these issues came up. Right. So, so I agree with you. It's the diaspora has to demonstrate the leadership that we've shown in the past always with regards to, to these particular issues. Now, the mayor was correct. There are many of us in the diaspora who are, I'm not going to say fanatic, but we are very much in support of Hellenism. It's not only about supporting Greeks and all the rest of that. It's about supporting Hellenism and what's right. Here we are in different nations around the world, and we can't comprehend some of the issues that are taking place. We, we are nations of rules of law. We understand these particular things. And we're here now speaking today, you and I and John and, and certainly Peter. We're here discussing these issues, not as Hellenic people, not as Pontian people, but we're here, we're, we're here discussing these issues as Americans, because these are American issues, important to America. And this is what we have to do to educate everyone, to make them understand the things that took place someplace else can take place much closer to home if we allow these things to take place and not acknowledge them. So I thank you, Lou, for everything that you've done. And certainly... What we discussed today, you and I have to talk about further. John, if you if you can, if you want Absolutely. to address some, so, yes, I'm sorry, Lou. Did you, were you going to Lou, say? I got to jump on another Zoom call. We have the legislative group. Oh, I have to go. I'm sorry. I have to jump no, on no, another Zoom. Don't apologize. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lou. John, okay. if you can, if you want to address Thank some you. architectural right. issues, and then we'll call it a we'll call it a day. Okay. Sure. I just I just want to make a couple of comments on uh, on such a spectacular uh, project and presentation. But first, I want to say to Peter, about 10 years ago, I was in Batumi because I was working on a project there. And uh, that's in the Republic of Georgia for the people right. who aren't familiar with that part of the world. And I remember the very first thing the mayor said to me when he asked me where I was from and my background, he said, you know, you're not the first Greek to come here. So, <laughs> yeah, John, can I say something? Sure. For the Aris, it's also a very popular pointed name. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, a very good friend, and I, I should mention that, Costas for the is a professor, uh, very, I know him for many, many years. As a matter of fact, I was speaking to him the other day, and I thank him for that. And I spoke to Professor for the Aris and Dr. Vlasis Atsidis and my very good friend and activist for many, many years, Stefano Stanimanidis. For the others, it's also, so I was gonna ask you, if, if, you know, sometime, if you, if you have any roots from Pondos. Um, I, I, I'm aware as far back as my grandfather who was actually born in uh, Gallipoli, but I'm sure his ancestry is, for, is from Pondos, for okay. sure. Uh, I, just wanted, I just wanted to make a couple of comments purely from an architectural standpoint, because I want to make sure that um, this is understood. You know, um, I, I've seen it written that memory begins where history ends. And so as, a, as an architect, when you're tasked with the idea of memorialization, you know, however you might in, interpret that, um, really what you're trying to do is capture and build form the memory of an event or an experience. And 
um, especially the case if it's a traumatic event. And we've all been to many memorials, you know, here or around the world that try and, uh, and, and capture that idea. Um, and so, you know, it's always been a question among architects, an, an intellectual, an academic question. How do you architecturally represent a history when it's, it, it's a history of loss and displacement? And what I find fascinating about this project and what really sparked me when uh, Slotiri was explaining it to me, it's, it's born out of an imprint. It's born out of a context which is now lost from a place far away, this monastery in Trabzon. But what Slotiri has done, he's kind of cast it in a new place and then taken its negative to create something new. So there's kind of a duality that he's created with the, with the past and the future, with before and now, with positives and negatives. And he's transported that to, um, to a new world. And what I particularly love about this is that it's a bit subversive in a way because its whole reason for being was, was the result of, of what everyone objectively would call a tragic experience but he's creating a place that's a crucible for revival. So it utterly defeats the intent of the original event that was its genesis, which was a genocide. So I, I, I just found that so fascinating in, in, in how it keys back architecturally. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into it, so Didi, you know, we architects tend to read a lot into things, but the fact, you know, the overlay and the imprint and the fact that you chose ultimately to kind of treat that area as hallowed ground and, and build the project around it, I thought was fascinating. And one, and one more thing I want to add is, is that, so Didi, I'll tell you why he's such a great architect, because he's able to imbue his project with all of this meaning and all of this this kind of you know, uh, cultural gravity. But at the same time, he's thinking about the economic impact. Uh, Hellenicon is a new area of Athens. You know, There's been so much talk and so much hype about it. And what better way to support um, a new area like this than by creating a, a, a public place to gather, which could be conference centers, um, areas for research, you know, we've seen projects around the world, for example, the High Line in New York City, which was basically a vertical uh, horizontal park that basically was the, the catalyst to to uh, spark development in an area of Manhattan that was largely forgotten. So the fact I think that this project works on so many different levels really, really makes it unique. That's what I that's what I wanted to say. So so. I don't, you're not reading too much into it. Actually, you're reading exactly what's going on because obviously you can't read it because you've done exactly the same job that I've been doing all these years. I don't want to enter this conversation in such depth uh, to explain it to the, to the molecule of the idea. The reason being is because I believe sometimes it's so simple, this idea of actually, you know, it's like, you know this statue that is like it's uh, uh, of the there's this statue of a, of an immigrant carry, carrying a suitcase and he's he's just half empty yeah next mm -hmm. to the beach front and it's exactly the same logic you know it's like how could I translate this when the president of Greece sh said it so nicely she just read the verse everybody was crying in the theater she says when you cut the roots of a man it's painful and it's so painful but then again i didn't want to enter this realm of like mnemosyno you know, and sadness and you know like we know yeah we really sure. know there's no question that we know at least we that we're here we know but it's not this is not the Udysses museum in berlin this is not a, a slap in the face of somebody so you remember what you've done to us you know we're sitting here with you now in the center of your city don't forget it's not like that at all, because this is for us. This is the revived um, Surmena, the revived uh, Argyropoli, the revived Elenikon. And all this population has flourished throughout the world. They didn't just come and like barricade themselves in an area where, you know, that's it, and we're going to make it here and stuff. They, 
they actually became fantastic. It, 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 it grew. It's like somebody broke their, their heart and their house and they, like they went everywhere and they said, okay, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it brand new. We're going to do it so much better. And if you see the, the creativity among the, the, the businessmen, I mean, even the biggest businessmen in Greece, and the majority of the biggest businessmen in Greece are Podi. Yeah? Mm. You see this happening. You're like, what's going on? You know, this, is, this needs to be celebrated. Exactly the same way, like Mr. Stavriani, they said, you know what? One Sunday a year, the grapes become tables and we go and we celebrate on top of mm. them. Because... This is enough. You know, you say that, everybody understands what's going on. But if you analyze it, we're not celebrating death. We're celebrating life. Absolutely. It's the next step. Yeah. And we're celebrating and we remember. We remember on top of that grave, we're going to eat and drink. And if Panagia Sumela is not a grave, obviously, but it's a, it's a ripped out memory. It's, it's the grandmother. You know, she's not here anymore. We cannot visit her grave. That I'm, we're going to go on top and we're going to uh, let our children play. And we're going to communicate and we're going to make it a global center. And yeah. we're going to bring American associations in it and, and, and Balkan associations in it and Australian associations. And we're going to connect this, not to recognize uh, uh, our genocide. Who can deny this? The genocide is recognized. In the conscious is recognized. Now, obviously, Needs to go through parents, but this is not the point because one way or another, within the years to come, it's going to be recognized. No, to continue keeping the legacy alive, to continue the beauty of the culture, the beauty of the body alive and strong, where in the best site of Europe, because Hellenicon is the best site of Europe, the most expensive site of Europe, and this is where. You need to take care of everybody then. And you need to allow exactly. it to be sustainable. Sustainable culturally, politically, economically. This is, it's okay to be sustainable financially. It should mm -hmm. be sustainable financially. Yeah, because this, if is, it is, this is the opposite of a windswept cenotaph on some hill. This is exactly. a live, vibrant place. Yeah, because this is it. It's important. We're reaching on top of that memory. This is it. We're so celebrating... Yeah. So, Thierry, maybe I, I missed it, but if you're kind enough to remind us, what is the capacity uh, in the square footage or in square meters of this yes. uh, project? Like this project, I'm always thinking now, listen, the future is all about hubs now, nowadays. I mean, even bigger universities shrink down the square meters because it's not necessary. So we need to look at this project as a 30-year, 40, 50, 100-year project. So... It was great to be able to keep it in human scale. So the project itself is around, like, obviously it's a pre-concept. Uh, yeah, and this is not a finalized design. Yeah. This is like just uh, so we can communicate what we're planning to do. So the the, the building above ground is around 5,000 square meters, and um, below is around 2,500 uh, um, uh, capacity uh, conference center. And meeting rooms, etc. Now, yeah. second phase, which is coming soon, is where we sit down and we actually write down the brief and the, and the space areas and we work out exactly what it is. Nevertheless, as a hub, that location and that space with that, with all this, in this wonderful weather that we have here, with all these open spaces, with the water elements, with, with the trees, with the, all the greenery, everything, this space can be a hub for anything from a global center all the way to a university all the way to recording the Pontiac language and writing it down, all the yeah. way to collecting the music, all the way to, to have the, a library of very valuable uh, books or, or icons that these uh, people brought together. So it's endless. You know, the, the, the few, once you have the hub as a centralized piece like that, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's like the Apple store is beautiful and stuff. You will have every Apple application and product in that place. It doesn't matter, you know, it's like the size is irrelevant. The size is just a backdrop to us living. The, uh, it's a vessel of life, like uh, Kostadinides were used to say. So this is the idea. And uh, like, uh, I mean, the most successful projects are poems that can be translated in whatever whatever sentiment brings to everybody who reads it. I cannot define what's going to happen. So but, Thierry, yeah. one, one more question. When approximately you're breaking ground 
uh, when approximately would be the completion? I'm not. I'm not in position to say that. I mean, I, I, I here's, here's what I have to say because Peter, you, you said that you know two, three years, etc. That's, that's that's what I, I think. That's what that, I was told. No, 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 no. But that's but that's. I'm, it's, I'm from the construction. It was a rumor. I'm from the construction end of it. It's, it's and, and, hearsay. And, 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 and two or three years is not what happens. It, it usually takes at least a couple of years, etc., with regards to design and uh, you know development of drawings and all the rest of that. You know, then you get contractors and then you build it. So if I was to look at a fast track scenario, it's like, in my mind, it's like five years, you know, quite frankly. But, I just want, but I just, I just want you know, my uncle to be alive to see it. It's going to be the happiest no, day of his life. No, no, of Maybe course. he will. Maybe he will. <laughs> we're we're going to wrap it up now. But I, I will say I, I'd like to thank everyone. And and, and so, Titi, in terms of what you said earlier, uh, the, com the yeah, collective memory aspect, the collective memory aspect of keeping this, this, pro this concepts alive, et cetera. And also John and Sotiri, when you were talking about simple thoughts, you know, simple ideas, simple concepts, the, the most complex concepts are actually simplistic. Mm -hmm. In other words, something that becomes evident when, when, it's, when it's indicated, it becomes evident and it's the most complex and it's very difficult to, to, to formulate it in such a simplistic fashion. And I think the architects and the, and the people conceptually who put this together really, really came out with simple concepts that are very complex and we'll be discussing for years. I'd just like to wrap it up. So if we can, some final words and I'll start with uh, Peter, some final words. I said, I am just in, literally in awe with what I saw. And I feel, I'm telling you, I feel moved, uh, proud. I'm looking forward to see this, uh, uh, this project come to completion. This way we can start enjoying it. Congratulations to all the people who are involved with this. Congratulations to you, Lou, for bringing this and educating people. That's Thank you. So, Tini, some final words, uh, you know. I think I just thank you so much for embracing this, uh, Lou. Really, this is uh, wonderful for me to be able to explain this because this is this is what we live for. You know, John, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, this, uh, this is the only thing we live for is to be able to offer, to come at one point in our careers that we can offer something like that that will just change the the rule of the of the history you know if we can do that this is success for us you know and this is a, no this it's, is a it's, wonderful it's something it's something that's a success for everyone and so Titi, I'm, I'm so glad that that you were involved in it and you've come up with these concepts and i, I want to thank my co-moderator today uh, john fortiadis because john was the one who said hey lou Let's do a let's do a, a panel discussion on this because yeah, he was very he, he was very uh, excited when he saw it. So he, John, he, I have I have to thank you for bring for helping bring my, bring us together quite frankly right? it, for this for this thing. Some final only, words, John. Yeah, I was well. Just following on what you said, not only is the the theme and the cause very very important, but I think it's also important to recognize you know talent within our global community. And um, and there's and this is a, a perfect example of that, because here you have an architect who had to deal with very, very heavy cultural issues, very heavy. How do you how do you begin to deal with this? And what he's managed to do is out of those heavy issues, uh, develop a design which is vibrant and full of life. So to me, this is a, a thousand percent success. And he's done it in in a way that is re really has intellectual depth. So I congratulate you, Satiri. Bravo. You make me blush, yeah. uh, John. Uh, this I, is uh, really from you coming, this compliment from you. I've told you before, I've told you offline, but this is uh, really, uh, for me, really, uh, well, you know. This you, is deserve it. you deserve the recognition <laughs> so and the project deserves a recognition. And, you know, great projects can get can get support and they can rally people around them. And I think I believe this, that very this, this, this project very has that type of potential. That. I really believe it. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. And thank you, thank Lou, for, you so for making me a part. No, of no. Th th thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, because to the audience, this has been an amazing panel discussion. Quite frankly, what we've discussed today, you, you really wouldn't hear anywhere else. Anywhere mm -hmm. else. Sure. 
people make presentations, but it's here where you get the background, the history, the, the thought process, the, the emotions that come out of these, these particular projects. And this one here is, is just an amazing, amazing project. For the audience, uh, um, next week I've added another event. So, you know, it came out of the blue, but I think it's very important. We're, we're going to have an event called The Life and Times of Aristotle, Socrates, Onassis. And that's next week, uh, Sunday at 2 p.m. And uh, part of the reason why, why we decided to have it is obviously we're going to have a lot of events, Peter, with regards to, uh, to the burning of Smyrna. And uh, certainly this year is the 100th anniversary of that. And Onassis, the Onassis story is one of the uh, hundreds of thousands of stories of survivors of the Smyrna genocide. And it's a story that must be told. In this particular case, Onassis is, was a product of the Smyrna catastrophe. So, uh, and, and one of the most fascinating men, quite frankly, besides being one of the most wealthy of the 20th century. And also, also coming out uh, on, uh, I believe, February the 3rd, up to February the 20th, is going to be an off-Broadway play called Onassis that I personally have supported, you know, to bring on off-Broadway. And also that, uh, that we will be involved with at EMCA because we will, we will also uh, have uh, uh, a charity, charity uh, Onassis play event where the proceeds, 100% of the proceeds uh, will go to charities that we've, that we've selected for this year. I'll have more information on that in the near future. Again, to the audience, uh, our events are listed always on uh, emca.com, emca.com. So please go to, uh, you know, to that uh, website to find out about our events. Also, this particular uh, panel discussions and all our panel discussions are on YouTube under the EMBCA uh, channel, the EMBCA channel. For those who are interested in AHEPA, it's ahepa.org. And uh, again, thank you all for a magnificent panel discussion on a very important topic. And certainly as was indicated by uh, Senator uh, Pikeus, uh, there are things that we have to do as it relates to the upcoming anniversary on May 19th of, of the uh, Pontian genocide. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, John, again, for, uh, for co-moderating the event. And thank you to the thank audience. You so for the thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks thank you. Again. Next time. Thank you. Thank